today he's chosen to talk to us about Seville, the great Babylon of Spain. And like many people who visited Seville, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Rafa, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, honestly, every time I, I come here, it's like coming home. Because it is. <laughs> um, and also because you're the friendliest group of people imaginable. It's, it's always nice to see such friendly faces. So, imagine, if you will, that we could come back in 500 years' time and see the world again through our eyes in the year 2520. Imagine what we'd see. Imagine New York City, the skyline sprung to amazing new heights with technologies that we can't even begin to comprehend and the monuments of our time dwarfed beneath them. We'd of course be... I hope my mic's working okay. We'd of course be surprised and awed by what we saw. But what if we came back in 500 years' time and nothing much had changed at all? What if New York was largely a collection of heritage buildings from the 20th century, surrounded by a vast, undifferentiated sprawl? The energy that had gone into creating the Big Apple, Earth's most influential city, had simply drained away. We'd probably be even more surprised and awed by that, as we wouldn't be expecting it. Seville was the New York of its day. Earth's most influential city. Its streets were paved with gold and opportunity, and its population was dynamic and flourishing. It was the go-to place for every adventurer, entrepreneur, chancer, who wanted to make the world theirs. Great cities have their century. London owned the 19th. New York owned the 20th. Seville owned the 16th. It was the most prosperous place on earth for a time, engorged with the gold and silver of the new world, all of which came through its gates. The Seville that we know today was shaped in its golden age, its character, its taste, its flair, yet the energy that built it has long since drained away. It is now largely a collection of heritage buildings from the 16th century, surrounded by a vast, undifferentiated sprawl. History doesn't move in a linear trajectory. It moves in loops and eddies. The forward momentum through which we live our lives is an idea that exists mainly in our heads, one that we project onto the world. History, on the other hand, has a habit of turning back on itself. The fortunes of Seville, of Seville are the fortunes of Spain. Its great century was the century of the Spanish Empire, the wealthiest and most powerful on earth. And by the time that century was done, in 1598, when Philip II died, the empire was already on the decline. In that century, Seville's Siglo de Oro she managed to turn herself into one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. She is much more than a place to visit. She is the fiery soul of Spain herself. For half the world, the image of Spain is Andalusia, the romantic south, and Seville is the dangerously bewitching soul of Andalusia. Sun or shade, no half measures. Here is Spain intensified. In the summer, the air itself melts. The ground smoulders at our feet. The light is brilliant, colours vivid, shades extreme. We are in a European city, but more so. For Europe, this feels exotic. Civilians have a sharp wit and a jaunty stride, a confidence that comes from knowing what it's like to have ruled the world a pulse that is loud and flamboyant, a daily rhythm that defies comprehension, and a hot African temper underneath. 
Its Islamic buildings sit like a sediment, powerfully contributing to that flavor, reminding us of desert roots. Once we have digested the daily stream of data that's dumped on us by our tour guide, we long to sit in a cafe and feel the city, let its personality enter. This is how we make Seville ours. Seldom on our return home do we narrate to our friends what happened in 1362, although we'll be getting to that. But we do talk about that quirky spot in the secluded patio, about a particular flavor of food. We absorb the city more through our being than our head. It is not just a place we visit. It is made of us. It is a stirring of collective emotion, and its personality needs to be felt. If we are used to our daily rhythm being quite constant, here we take a step over that frontier of reality. <coughs> the city is languid and lazy in the mornings as the sun brings in early heat. By midday, there's a bustle, a semblance of life. Everything functions as it should, but no sooner has all this begun than the afternoon contracts into a stupefied torpor. Seville lives for the evening. This is when her artistry springs to life. She has the vitality of an opera stage, so abundantly expressive, so close to caricature, a magic bag of tricks, great fun, great excitement, spontaneous beauty. People step out to be seen, and the proud, ornamented houses join the parade. In nooks and crannies, shaded patios filled with flowers, tantalizing glimpses through doorways and alleys, her inhabitants move about this dead set with a stagey air. As the streets become crowded, the rhythm accelerates, pressure builds to a happy fever, and the night detonates. Beating happens in a frenzy of noise, big tables, big families, children playing at midnight, it's rumbustuous, cariñoso, and loud. The streets become hideous with hooting, scooters roaring, every dial turned up. Insects join the general cacophony, chirping all night. This is a culture that loves to make noise. After all that's done, it's time to go out. Singles swagger into the soulful night heavy with jasmine and orange and the sad strains of Canto Ondo, Oriental, Gregorian, Islamic, Jewish, that the gypsies have made their own. A sensual magic begins to work, drugged by food, wine, jasmine, so much beauty and hospitality. You could be at an impromptu flamenco performance or a party in the patio of a house. At six or so, it's time for bed. Next day, the early morning sweeper tidies the night's success, putting on the city's face for the days to come, slowly returning to life. Strong coffee for a sore head, a thread of smoke, a tang of anise, smell of fat from a churro stand, and the happy cycle repeats. Like New Yorkers, civilians have character in abundance, and a swaggering self-confidence <coughs> that comes from having known what it's like to occupy the very center of life. Even though her century was a long time ago, that character is undiminished to this day. Seville's golden age began in 1503, when she won the great prize of being granted monopoly over all trade with the New World by Isabel, just a year before she died. It was an extraordinary move, one that set in motion a way of thinking that has persisted to this day. <clears throat> Many advised against creating a monopoly and a single port of trade, suggesting that the country would benefit far more from distributing its wealth across the regions, allowing the whole economy to flourish and allowing widespread new industries to generate. But Isabel's slow, devout nature tended towards autocracy. She was afraid of the Muslim threat along the Mediterranean coast. She was afraid of the power of Aragon, who she thought might continue to dominate her fledgling country. 
she treated her newfound colonies as her own private property and intended to steer the maximum amount of money straight into the royal treasury. Seville, of course, was not an obvious choice. Cadiz, her rival, would perhaps have been more appropriate. But Cadiz was considered a little too exposed. The city was forever coming under attack, close enough for an invading fleet to breach the harbour, close enough for Drake to famously boast that he could singe the King of Spain's beard. Imagine how much more frequently it would have been attacked if Cadiz had harboured all the gold of the New World. She was never as lucky in fortune as Seville. Even Columbus chose not to sail from there in 1492 because the port of Cadiz was full of ships deporting Spanish Jews, so he sailed from Palos instead. Isabel chose to burrow her fleet deep inland for safety. 80 miles upriver to the old Almohad port at the Arenal, even then hardly a port. The moorings and shipyards <clears throat> were on the riverbank. Yet it was a safe haven of sorts. Out of such improbable circumstance, a port 80 miles inland, imagine the port of Swindon, a city with a landed gentry that had no mercantile experience, came all the gold of the New World, and Seville had her century. It was a move that set in motion the foundation for Isabel's new Spain, autocratic, immutable, grandiose, and irrational, that has persisted to this day. The fact that the city had no mercantile experience was a significant element in its downfall. Only a decade before Seville was granted its monopoly, the entire mercantile class of the country had been deported. The loss of the Spanish Jews at the moment when Spain most needed skills to administer the finances of its vast and ac accidentally acquired empire was a fatal move. Many of the same Jews moved on to set up the new banking houses of Amsterdam and Germany, into whose debt Spain very quickly fell, paying vast interests on loans as she slowly bankrupted herself. Ultimately, they had a kind of revenge. One would imagine for a great trading port to flourish, there would need to be a great shipbuilding industry to serve it. But there were no suitable trees near Seville just olives, as far as the eye could see. Nor the skills fit for such an enterprise. Philip II tried to buy wood from Poland to build a fleet, and was so disappointed by the quality of ships built in Seville that they were forbidden from taking part in the American voyages. The city never managed to compete with the Basque shipyards. Such were the beginnings of her Siglo de Oro. In compound foolishness, it unraveled. All ships bound for America had to leave from here. Land on the other side. This is a map that can be found in the, in the archive of the Indias in the middle of Seville next to the cathedral. It's extraordinary. This is what the world looked like in 1502. Um, these immensely complicated expeditions, which depended for their success on the timings of such things as the Bolivian rains and the hurricane season off the coast of Cuba, were regulated by the Casa de Contratación, or House of Trade, set up in the Alcazar, the royal palace. The explorer, Amerigo Vespucci, who had been running a Florentine business house in Seville, was appointed chief navigator to the Casa in 1508. He was responsible for licensing ship's captains and producing maps of routes and overseas territories. The Casa, controlled all vessels, goods, and passengers, including the missionaries, between Spain and the New World. <clears throat> a fleet was built up to shepherd merchant ships to and fro across the Atlantic and protect them from pirates, and the Casa ran its own navy yard. Exports in the early days were the provisions needed for the colonists, olives, wheat, textiles, ceramics, and leather, 
Coming the other way was gold and silver. The annual value of precious metals reaching Seville from, <coughs> rose from around 1 million pesos in 1530 to over 35 million by 1595. In order for the crown to have its percentage, the gold and silver needed to bear the name of the monarch. So new mints were set up in Lima, Potosi, Mexico, and others to return with coinage. And the Seville mint, so active under the Almohads, began to languish. As money poured in, so did people. The city grew from about 60,000 in 1530 to 150,000 by 1600, and was the largest and richest city in Spain, and one of the wealthiest in Europe. It was full of merchants, adventurers, nobles, and priests working the American fortunes, and every kind of criminal imaginable. A vast underworld <coughs> developed. Vagabonds, peddlers, prostitutes, and branded slaves, picaros, those hungry delinquents who'd go to any length to survive, Cervantes described them all. Murillo and Velasquez painted them. This was the nation's center of crime and sin, and also a city in an endless search for God. The great mosque was taken down, and a vast cathedral built in its place in a frenzy to impress. It is multi-bayed, square, on plan, set on the foundations of the mosque that it replaced with all the columns. The result is an impression of space without scale. No soaring central nave or focus, just more in every direction. It is heavy and quite brooding, boasting the biggest gold altarpiece in the world. The quality it possesses is of devout muscularity, size being its crowning glory, second only to St. Peter's in Rome. Let us construct such a grand cathedral that all who see it will think us mad, blow to the canons of the chapter with all the money in the world to spend. The cathedral is made great by its adjoining tower of the Geralda. The city's monopoly was never as exclusively Castilian as it appeared. Seville's lack of mercantile experience allowed a flourishing colony of Genoese merchants and financiers to move in and take a leading part in the traffic. In the 1520s, Charles V allowed his German bankers to provide capital for the trade, and there were Dutch, English, and other merchants involved, as well as businessmen from abroad who were trading through agents in the city. Great Babylon of Spain, wrote the poet Luis de Gongora. Map of all the nations, where the Fleming finds his Ghent and the Englishman is London. The idea that such a web of human activity could be controlled by a single bureaucracy proved hopelessly unrealistic, and for all the cascade of silver and gold, Spain remained a poor country. The reasons are many. As the colonies grew, Spanish industry did not. Seville had the opportunity which it failed to take of becoming the major producer of goods for the new world. It could have manufactured all the cloth and fabric for the Americas, yet curiously it preferred to import from other European cities. The only major product that was from Seville was olive oil. The problem was not a shortage of skilled labor, but the indifference of the local nobility who might have provided the investment. The Dutch, English, and French cut themselves huge shares of the Spanish pie. A good deal of the gold and silver never made it back. It was too tempting. The ready coinage was an effective world currency, and Spanish pieces of eight made of high quality silver were tradable everywhere, finding their way as far afield as China. Through piracy, an unknown, unknowable quantity of wealth still lies at the bottom of the sea. A good deal also disappeared illegally, unloaded at night from ships 
in the mouth of the Guadalquivir at San Luca and stowed on board vessels waiting to be taken to Northern Europe. The Casa de Contratación accused the Association of Merchants of participating in the fraud, but there was fraud at every level, from the generals of the fleet to the merchants of the Consulado, from the Casa de Contratación to the Council of the Indies itself. Such are the consequences of attempting single-minded control. The result is inevitably a leaking vessel. If Seville preferred to develop its, its business into an enormous market rather than an industrial center, it might have provided some commercial and banking institutions that were appropriate to its scale. The Seville Mint, the largest in the world, had little to do. It minted only coins of high denomination, not with New World gold, but with recycled Almohad gold. These eight Escudo coins were then, as now, worth a small fortune and could not be used in the shops. Their value was in trading between governments and royalties, purchasing armadas and fighting wars. They would shift from one treasury to another and remain there, never seeing the light of day, so they can often be found today in near mint condition. If you wanted to buy a ship, you would need a small bag of these coins. There were Spanish bankers in the early years, but most of them went bankrupt after the middle of the 16th century. And from then on, the great commercial fortunes of the city were made by foreigners. It was irksome that the silver and gold mined in the Spanish empire and sent to the greatest Spanish city <coughs> should mainly end up in the pockets of the Dutch and Genoese. Civilian aristocracy refused to touch industry or trade. They developed a culture of indolent nobility, taking the view that labor was degrading. Finally, the river itself betrayed her. There were a series of earthquakes and floods, one of the worst in January 1627, when the river poured through the gates and flooded the entire city. Around 3,000 houses were ruined. Another in 1683, which destroyed a third of the city. There were a total of 17 inundations in the 17th century. The earthquakes disrupted the river level and it began to silt up. The sandbar at San Luca, this is what it looks like today, virtually <coughs> closing the mouth of the estuary, became increasingly difficult to navigate and many ships floundered there. Some captains left Seville without their cargoes, which they then loaded dangerously on the open sea for the sandbar was considered an even greater risk. Ships were getting increasingly larger, making the problems ever greater. There were ideas put forward for dredging canals, widening the river mouth, but none were carried off, and eventually Seville had to accept the inevitable. Isabel's autocratic vision had floundered, quite literally, on the sandbar at San Luca. Cargoes in future would be loaded and unloaded at Seville's great rival, Cadiz. And that was it. A century was done. Seville's fortunes and misfortunes mirror those of the nation itself. Extravagance in wealth and power, <coughs> advantages squandered again and again through poor leadership. Cervantes lived here in the city's golden age when it was the center of the world. He conceived Don Quixote while serving time in Seville's royal jail in 1597. There could be no better eye than his to observe her at the very height of her crowning glory. This jail was quite unlike modern jails. It was a concentrated hive of 1800 or so of the wickedest characters found anywhere in the Spanish empire and itself a thriving marketplace. There were merchants inside who set up stalls in the courtyard, dancers, fiestas, food and drink, a microcosm of the city whose customers were thieves, blasphemers, pirates, and adulterers. The difference between inside and outside was a blurred line. <laughs> Nearly all of Cervantes' work 
draws on the surreal contradictions of Spanish society in its moment of glory. But there is one poem that he wrote which encapsulates Seville most succinctly. It is called Al Tumulo de Felipe II. Cervantes was out of jail in 1598 when Philip II died on September the 13th, and the town council ordered the city to prepare the greatest demonstration of mourning ever made. A giant simulacrum of a tomb was constructed with as much pomp and grandeur as possible. It took 52 days and filled the entire nave of the cathedral. You can see here, it's been drawn as if it's outside, but these are the columns of the cathedral itself, and it was built to fill the entire building. The council bought up nearly all the available black double bays to make mourning attire for its officials, creating a scarcity of the cloth and a huge price increase. The poor, who could no longer afford to buy the cloth, were imprisoned for failing to comply with the edict to wear black. There were <coughs> three levels to the monument, set up between the cathedral's two choirs. It was crowned by a dome topped with a globe, which in turn is, gra is grasped in the claws of a soaring phoenix. The bird's head reached almost to the vault of the cathedral. The structure was decorated in a multitude of paintings, statues, figures, inscriptions, altars, pyramids, and columns to commemorate the glories of Philip and his Spain. Now, as the ceremonies began, a disagreement broke out between the town council, the Inquisition, and the royal tribunal, because the tribunal had placed black cloth upon the bench where the judges and their wives were to sit. The secretary of the Inquisition ordered the mass to be stopped and excommunicated the entire tribunal. <laughs> the regent arrested the secretary, and the mass was unable to continue while excommunicated people were still in the church. This produced a tremendous standoff, and all parties remained seated in silence from early morning until four in the afternoon, when they eventually got up and just walked out. Cervantes saw the two, heard about the squabble and the insults that ended in nothing. Perhaps he even witnessed it. The result was his sonnet. The translation doesn't really do it justice. The language is deliberately coarse and profane, but the sonnet went viral. It was circulated across Spain in manuscript copy and broadsheet. Its huge popularity suggested an attitude to Philip II that didn't quite reconcile with the official one. And it produced a catchphrase which has lasted to this day. The last line, Fuese y no hubo nada, went in a puff of nothing. <laughs> Designed to show Seville's great riches, the costly monument was in reality a shell made of paper and wood. If you looked beneath, you could see that it floated on air, just as the civilian economy did. The city was practically bankrupt, giving the appearance of wealth, and its power structure was as wretched as the cathedral squabblers had revealed. As other poets had done, Cervantes recited his poem in the cathedral on December the 29th, and it was picked up by the chronicler Arino, who reported indignantly, Este día entró un poeta fanfaron y dijo una octava sobre la grandeza del tumulo. He was calling Cervantes a fanfaron, a braggart, identifying him with the braggart in the poem, and thus unwittingly blurring the line between reality and comic illusion that Cervantes loved to do. Many visitors who visit the cathedral today make their way first to Columbus's tomb. It's hard to miss. Here we see some of the pomp and grandeur of the simulacrum of Philip II. It's smaller though still twice human scale. It was originally intended for Havana Cathedral, where Columbus's remains were kept. But with the Spanish-American War and Cuban independence, he end up, ended up being returned here in 1898. 
to this new sarcophagus in Seville Cathedral. This was his tenth move. He had traveled more in death than life, somehow not being granted the right to rest in peace. What started with Columbus became a new world order, a trade in both directions, gold and silver coming in and going back out, a vision of utopia. This was unwit unwittingly Seville's most influential export, a noble and beautiful architecture packaged as a utopian dream and spread far and wide across her empire. America, north and south, is a dense tangle of founding myths and utopian longings. Cities made in the conquest of the new world were clones of the divine city. A chessboard grid organized from the Plaza Mayor and the main church, urban order over wilderness, utopia over reality, laid down uniformly by the Spanish state in all its new territories. It was inspired by the Roman model, order and grid, Cardo and Decumanus, and driven by a strong desire to break with the Muslim organic tradition. The Romans arrived wherever they did in a straight line, laid upon the ground in whichever wilderness they found themselves, a straight line, an arterial road off which they placed a perpendicular grid, a military camp, out of which cities emerged. The first European city in the New World was Santo Domingo. Drawn up on the 5th of August, 1502, you can see this map in the Archive of the Indias. Already it was an idea that was fully fledged, its military rigor cribbed from the siege camp at Santa Fe de Granada that Ferdinand and Isabel had constructed for their army of reconquest. American cities came from this. New York, the greatest utopian grid ever dreamt. To the very end of the 20th century, the grid has represented modernity, a fresh start, the good society, a utopian vision, just as it did then. We are now on the other side of that vision, returning to a more organic tradition, relearning what has been overlaid, this is where our, our philosophy comes in. Um, so I'm talking a little bit about utopias because being an architect, it is our preoccupation as well. The idea of moving towards the future by connecting, by reconnecting with the past, with lost history. Our practice is called future ancient technologies for that exact reason. These attempts at projecting noble ideals onto the world carry hidden repercussions. They were a way of simplifying things, ironing out inconsistencies. In the new world, there was often a pre-existing utopia beneath the grid planted on the wilderness that was completely overlaid. The breathtaking speed of urban development was an attempt by the Spanish crown to grant permanence to an act of occupation, followed by an evangelizing mission to save the native population recreate clones of Catholic Spain everywhere. Here, on the cusp of change, utopian talk is with us again, and it has an evangelical ring. Smart cities, big data, Seville has a very big smart prospectus. This is its, um, its uh, smart city region that is created in the old, part of the old 1992 expo site. These ideas, big data, they're going to save us. Seville is big with all of this. It's pushing it forward, but it, it's all very corporate driven. The future will undoubtedly contain these things, but we need to be vigilant with these visions. The question we must ask ourselves is, what will be the repercussions? Why do these utopias not consider the repercussions? What effect will all this have on how power accumulates? What will it mean for the individual in 20, 100, or 500 years' time? In Plato's day, the word for city was the same as its inhabitants, polis, city and citizens. 
We are the city. It is made of us. We are better attending to its well-being in advance than retreat. We know by now, from Seville's great colonial enterprise, that when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. <laughs> we are on the cusp of change. It seems that the past 60 years or so has been a kind of steady state, a prosperous and peaceful age. My lifetime, the time that we have all here enjoyed. Our descendants might look back, back at us in the year 2520 and see that this was a siglo de oro, golden days of innocence before the great change. Although utopia might not exist as a place, in Thomas More's sense it means no place, with skepticism built into the title, it can exist in fragments. We live amongst things that for centuries were utopian dreams. Public parks, libraries, universities, freedom of movement, healthcare, clean water, clean air. The fact that we can log on and speak to anyone, anywhere, was a crazy utopian dream for centuries. It took months for letters to reach the colonizers of the New World, and up to a year for the reply. When these things are successful, they become invisible, integrated into our lives so that we no longer see them. The only way that we realize how quietly radical they are is when they're taken away. And there are those who would happily do that. They are gathering. We must not let them in. We ought to locate these utopias, these spaces that enable us to live fully, live longer, become what we can become, and protect, develop, and expand them. If we don't, we will suffer from the blindness of the evangelists, disregarding what already exists. Seville is full of these spaces, as are the cities she spawned. We are the city. It is up to each of us to carry the weight and the responsibility. At best, the idea of utopia serves as an impulse, a direction, a point to aim for and from which we can look back at ourselves in the future from 2520 and judge how we were doing. It's an impulse that says, it's time for coffee. Yeah. <laughs>